same time, if at least one person from the team could indicate in the chat whether they consent to stream or not, that'd be great too. So, OG. Uh, PM, Nave, and I use she, they pronouns. I'll leave DPM shield eye, thanks. Uh, so Bay will be speaking first, she, her, and then Miko will be speaking second. I have no preference. Thank you. Closing up. Raymond, he, him, I'll be speaking first, and Max will be speaking, speaking second. Great. And CEO? Um, Bobby speaking first, no preference. Omar speaking second. I go by they, them. Thank you. All right, excellent. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, first and foremost, it seems that everyone consents to being streamed, recorded, etc. So I think that's a green light for the art comp. Um, second, I will attempt to time you in the chat, but please maintain your own timer. Remember to wrap up by 715, at which point the panel will stop taking note. Last but not least, um, please do indicate what your ideal POI preference is right before your speech so that people can, in fact, respect your time. And without further ado, on the motion that we all know, maybe have the Prime Minister to kick off this debate. You're here. Just checking I can be seen and heard. Hmm. Yes. Cool. And uh, preference POIs in the chat, please. This is a debate about maximizing the choice of Japanese voters, where there was no viable alternative form of government, where there was no competition that allowed the current government to actually engage with voters or gave them the incentive to actually try and capture their votes and to do things that were in their interests that was going to decrease that choice in what they could vote for. This was a less democratic system when it didn't maximize those choices. That was why the only solution was to break up the LDP. Firstly, I'll do a bit of setup, then I'll talk about why um, uh, why this government currently is in power, even though it probably lacks some level of public support. Then I'll talk about the impact of maximizing this choice, these choices by breaking up these parties. And finally, a short point on discourse. Okay, firstly, what does this look like? I think what this system is likely to look like is that uh, individual politicians within this party are still able to run in that they will be able to choose another party or rename, like have their own like named party, but that none of those parties can form the majority in a coalition or none of those parties could have the majority of the members of that government within them. And that meant they were able to run in that way. Um, I think the second thing is just to say that even though it says the government would break this up, uh, we can just probably assume that the fiat that like this would actually happen. Right. OK. Why is it likely that the LDP is able to stay in power, even though I think there is a level of waning public support? I think the first thing is just to note a critical piece of context, which is that this is a government that was set up after World War II. I think they're able to and they have been in power probably like pretty much since then, which means they are quite easily able to draw on things like economic su success, able to draw on the stability that has happened since then. And also the fact that they like became to power during a period of like quite a lot of overhaul and they have that historical set success to draw on in generations that have voted for them that are probably still alive, right? That is something that allows them to stay in power just because of the, like, the fact of political inertia. Second reason why they're able to stay in power while they still don't have necessarily that public support is I think the way that the system is set up where they are the most funded and where they are the ones who are able to run the most candidates in the most areas means that other parties simply don't have a way or an ability, don't have the capacity and therefore probably not the incentive to properly compete with them. I think a good analogy to draw is, for example, in Australia, often we like, you know, parties who know they aren't going to win in certain seats simply don't run candidates. And I think there's probably a similar analogous thing that happens here where they don't feel like they can compete and therefore do not. And I think the third thing to say is just in Japan, because the fact there is non-compulsory voting is obviously subject to all of those things that uh, or subject to all of the factors that make this sort of system not necessarily fully democratically representative. That is the fact that like, so um, that is for the, due to the fact that like often voting is hard and it's easier for the more privileged people to be able to access those, sy th those systems, able to go and vote at the times they are required to and so on. And the fact that this might have low turnout means they might have uh, not necessarily have that public support. 
Why is this likely to look more democratic when you break up this party? I think the first critical thing to note here is that when you break that political inertia, that is what causes people to actually reevaluate their beliefs and decide whether or not the party that they are now voting for is something that they actually truly believe in. And I think importantly, and specifically in this debate, it probably means comparing their belief in like the economic success of the LDP historically with their current relatively conservative policies and whether that is something that necessarily aligns with their belief when that political inertia is broken that allows people to actually evaluate those beliefs and so on. I think the second thing to note here is this is probably likely to generate very little backlash. That is for two reasons. The first is to say that it just means that like, you know, other parties are unlikely to backlash because it probably just gives them a better chance at actually having success in a democratic way because now they have, like, they don't have to compete against an absolute Goliath. But I think secondly, it is unlikely the LDP or, you know, former members of the LDP necessarily backlash because obviously they still have some level of advantage of still being the historical success or like, you know, historically in power. They're probably still able to draw on that. I don't think they have such a huge, huge disadvantage. They would never get in power. They probably still don't hugely backlash to this in the first place. That is why this is still likely to be an incredibly democratic system. Okay, why is this incredibly important for politics? I think the first and most important reason for this is that it just generates better political competition. That is to say that in the current system where there is no incentive or capacity for smaller parties to even go up against the LDP, that means they are unable to, um, they don't have to compete with those other candidates. What changes under this system? Firstly, you have to compete with other candidates that were originally within the LDP. And you have to differentiate yourself from those people and you have to show why your policies are necessarily better. That is obviously good in creating more range, but also you increase the buy-in from other parties who, can't, who weren't able to compete with them originally, which means they now need to go into areas and like try and engage voters better and try and compete better and fund those campaigns better. Why is this incredibly good? Firstly, it creates far more choice because there is a range of different policies because they, these people need to differentiate themselves in some ways. And because of the fact that Japan has like proportional representation, that probably means you're able to actually get a range of those policies represented in your government. The second reason is that it now compels those um, people being elected to actually explain their policies better because they need to differentiate themselves yet again. And that means that you are far more informed as a voter when you go to the ballot box as to which actually represents you. The third thing is those policies are just more considered because they actually have to do that in order to compete with other candidates, which means those policies about international relations or social policy are actually just better. And I think the fourth reason is now they actually have to engage with voters more because they cannot rely on political inertia, which means they actually have to go and represent those communities and talk to those communities. And that is obviously critically important for democracy in terms of maximizing choice. Before I go on to impacting this, I'll take a POI from closing if they have one. Why would a government structure that is likely to be formed by LDP itself have the interest to break the same party that gave them the same power? Uh, I think just the motion assumes the fear that you would, in fact, be able to do this. But I think you can also reasonably say that the LDP, like individual members within the LDP, probably aren't extremely opposed to this because, for example, they can obviously still run. Like, first of all, they can still run, but I think they can also still draw on the fact that they've had time in government to engage other voters they think can still vote for them. So I think there are still probably pretty it's still probably pretty unlikely for them to engage or like to have a significant backlash to this when they can probably still do that i think it's also fair to say there is a relative level of political difference and range within the ldp because of the fact they are the only party you can probably successfully get elected in there's probably a lot of people who join it but probably have differences in opinion and views in there and they are now able to better differentiate themselves and represent themselves and though they can still have a degree of success under the new system i think we can still fit this in but i think it's also something that a lot of people would have an interest in coming okay why ought you weigh this in the importance of political competition incredibly highly. I think the most important thing in this debate is maximizing the choice of voters because that is ultimately what makes a system more democratic. It's also what makes a system simply like, and, and that manifests in multiple ways just because, because now you have more candidates, you're probably likely to engage more disillusioned voters who are now able to like more encouraged to go to the ballot box and so on. Um, and that is obviously going to increase representativeness. And it also encourages those politicians to actually engage with people. That is obviously an incredibly good thing. I think that you ought weigh that incredibly highly. I think there is also importance in terms of like over like making political discourse probably better because again it prompts a relative degree of change in the types of policies and ideologies that are represented that is probably a good thing as well um in conclusion very proud to propose saying the prime minister for a fine speech maybe have the leader of opposition make the case for the opening up Hello, am I heard? Yep, you're yep. Welcome. Okay. I, shit, sorry. 
Hello. Uh, POS and chat, please. Thank you. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Let's go. Let's have a little bit of a math lesson. 276 is not even 60% of the seats. This fact, among other structural reasons that I will give to you for the next seven minutes of my life, prove that breaking up the LDP is not necessary and is in fact adverse to the interests of Japanese democracy. What we're going to prove is three following things. First, we're going to prove that breaking up the LDP is against the interests of the Japanese people, which engages directly with the democracy argument that comes from PM. Second, we're going to prove that it creates adverse macroeconomic impacts for Japanese spending. And third, we're going to prove adverse political impacts, which directly engages with the competition argument from Prime Minister. The rebuttals will be integrated. First, let's argue why it becomes good governance without the breakup. First, let's respond to the point that the current way the LDP is structured is undemocratic. The first reason why it is still democratic is because even amidst scandals and corruption, the LDP has responded quite well. The proof of concept is clear. Yoshida currently fired his son and let go of the individuals that were currently aligning with the Unionist Church post-Abe assassination. The second reason is that the structures in order to correct the LDP in the event that they are corrupt still exist. This is largely based on things such as approval ratings, which is a big thing in Japanese democracy. For example, Kishida's son was be went below 50%, which led to the firing of his son. And precisely, Shinzo Abe, for example, resigned during COVID because a large part of his approval ratings plummeted as a result of poor COVID response. Third is that while LDB constantly wins, they do not assume that they will win. So for a lot of it, while the you know scandals and bad stuff that they do gets quelled at the point in time, that's largely because they are very well with delivering economic growth. They give pretty good governance, for example. And even when they don't perform well, as I proved just now, there are structures that allow people to hold them accountable and push them out of bad push out the bad people out of office. The fourth reason also is that within the own LDP, there is a lot of competition. So the proof of concept for this is, for example, uh, sorry if I butchered the names, Taco. Takorono and Suga, for example, compete to counterbalance the current policies and actions that Yoshida currently does. What does this prove? We prove that the real source of mandate for the LDP is not like some undemocratic principle where they're just like the benevolent um, dictatorship, but rather it's the idea that ever since they have been unified and executed, the Japanese economy has seen a lot of an economic boom, even under Abe economics, where a lot of people, even in rural areas, got access to jobs and other economic opportunities. While opening government raises the concern of no opposition, and allegedly that's bad for some general unnuanced reason to Japan, this precise argument proves that there is no necessity for opening government's benefit of choice because as it currently stands, while there is a lot of power in the hands of the LDP, they've used it quite well. The second argument, is on stability. It is very important to have stability for the Jap for Japanese prosperity for three key reasons. The first reason is because it, they rely on stability in order to receive a lot of investment and trust from international actors and you know people in the in international economy. So in the status quo, leaders, even if they recognize that the LDP may have some differences, it's not extreme to the point that they feel like they are unworthy of investment or that they don't trust their investment should they invest in Japan. Regardless of how they act, it's often perceived, regardless of how they act, the mere act of breaking up is something that's going to send a signaling effect that is perceived as a loss of stability and whether or not that improves or you know doesn't improve for example the Japanese democracy individuals in the short term or for example people from the US and other economies are less likely to invest in Japan second of all why are there security ties? So currently, there Japan is uh, Japan is quite afraid of Chinese presence in corridors because currently they're trying to contest territory for each other. There are a lot of other things, concerns with regards to the relationship with China as well. Currently, China, for example, North Korea going on as well. And as a result of that, they still do need this stability. Um, but the third thing is that the Japanese rule is quite <laughs> effective, but precisely because of this unity. So for example, while they currently had negative interest rates, for example, and other economic problems like that, they were still able to manage negative consequences. Though this is only possible currently because while there is inflation, that inflation does go somewhere positive for Japan. Things like employment, things like trade, and other economic benefits. In the world where we have a new administration as a result of breaking up these people together and they're going to compete for all the stocks, that creates a loss of confidence through the primary people that provide them this inflation or provide them these economic benefits. Why is this form of economic trust important? As it stands, Japan is currently increasing in regards to spending in recent years, largely because they're currently facing themselves with an aging population and a demographic winter. Very recently, Kishida sent out child care packages and subsidies for 
you know, couples in order to encourage people not just to get married, but also to have families, which put a dent in their pocket, which is precisely why they have to rely a lot more on a lot of the stability or the foreign investment that goes away if they send the signaling effect that, well, currently we're breaking each other up. The last thing I want to prove is on how you politicize issues and why this is bad for Japan. But before I go on, go ahead, CG. You can cherry pick all the good examples of policy you want, but the fundamental fact is competition is what clears out the bad. Japan has the highest debt to GDP ratio in the OCCD for a reason, and that reason is there's no competition. Um, so currently you don't really explain why that is necessarily a bad thing. You just cherry pick to go against our examples when in reality what I've provided you is empirical and structural reasons for why there's competition within them. So if competition is your benefit, you have to prove why that form of competition uh, is good. But next, let's actually respond to that competition idea on the third argument on politicizing issues. So what you need to know with regards to Japan is some issues are things that get addressed right away precisely because they're uncontroversial. So this looks like giving more access to education in rural areas or, for example, more economic support to people in rural areas or prefectures. LDP empirically has done this. But if you pursue the breakup of the LDP, this creates bad incentives to make un very uncontroversial issues controversial precisely because these like broken up forms of the LDP will start to have to compete with each other for seats. Why? The first reason is because often the negotiations now become bargaining so, for example, unless you do X, we won't fund education. Unless you do Y, we won't fund, for example, supporting economies in rural areas. And just for a little intuition pump, this looks like what currently the Republicans and the Democrats are doing right now in the U.S., which is compromised like Medicaid and affected the health welfare for a lot of people on the ground. The second reason is because they compete, because they're quite ideologically similar to each other. So in order for them to acquire seats, they have to compete and market themselves to the precise same people with more or less the same political ideology. So while you agree that there is competition, this this competition leads towards them becoming significantly less effective and you deprive a lot of the benefits that I've explained in argument one and argument two. The impact for this is quite simple. The first impact is that it's bad because we might not pass policies because the broken up parts of the LDP might not even arrive at important concessions. The second reason is because it takes longer to pass because of all the filibustering and coalescing, especially insofar as they're competing with the same kinds of individuals with same kinds of ideologies. But a lot of the issues that we're talking about here are urgent education aging population people need welfare in rural areas and therefore is something that government has to stand for vote oo i think the opposition for that fine speech maybe now have the deputy prime minister close off the open cup case awesome assuming i can be seen and heard yes uh, If the LDP is so good as opening opposition wants to characterize, members of the LDP will just get reelected. The benefit of this, however, is there is significantly greater political reckoning in Japan that actually forces people to think about uh, and engage with politics and think about what is best for the country. Two issues in this speech. Firstly, how this impacts politics, and then secondly, on democracy. Firstly, on politics. What I'm first going to do here is extend on an argument Neve talks about, about discourse and how this influences Japan's position in IR. I think it's imped incredibly important to note that having an uncontested conservative narrative on what Japan did during World War II actually has a really big impact on Japan's place in the world, in particular its relationships with South Korea and China as a result of the actions of the Japanese army during the Second World War. I think this is incredibly important because what you see in Japan in the status quo and for the last 20, 30 years is a lot of activism to try and push the government to uh, acknowledge what acknowledge what Japan, acknowledge fault for what Japan did and what was wrong. And I think the important thing to note is that when you get absolutely zero give from a government that has entrenched itself because of economic policies and development that has never been contested, you get massive political controversies. And in particular, because the LDP has weaponized this thing as an issue of national pride, other, other parties do not necessarily contest on it. No Notably, this changes at the point at which you get increased amount of competition, the point at which another party is potentially elected that opens the floor for increased political debate about what Japan's, Japan's stance should be, for example, on history textbooks and how they should depict its actions in World War II. This responds firstly to the idea about stability that we get from opening opposition just then, because Japan had a semiconductor trade water with South Korea very recently. The Senkaku Islands issue is in fact like the um, north, like the, they're in the, 
I cannot remember which islands, like the, the cardinal direction, but the Senkaku Islands issue is worsened by the fact there is an underlying degree of tension between uh, China and Japan out of un unresolved issues of history. So I think, firstly, it's incredibly important they respond to this, and this also immediately deals with the idea of stability. Secondly, then, on the loss of stability, it's important to note this only happens once, right? The loss of stability is incredibly short term, and if it is so true that the LDP is so good economically, then it's unlikely to influence in the long term as well. But also, it is just deeply untrue that democracy, uh, you know, is something that people actually worry about. I think it's actually much more true that uncontested governments is what is more worrying for investment and for economic confidence because you are worried the government is going to do something without any meaningful backlash. Uh, and the fact that having increased uh, actual time to discuss policies increases the ability and confidence to ensure that this is actually a consensus decision. But also, like political issues that I just pointed out cause instability as well. But even at the end of this issue on politics, right, if Japanese people are willing to trade off stability for having something that represents their views on other political issues to a greater degree, we would trade it off in this debate. We think democracy is the most important issue, and I think people have the ability to understand what is most valuable for them. It's not maximized to the proper degree in the status quo because there isn't immediate, a, a, a realistic and a good amount of competition, but we can maximize that on the other side of the house. But again, if you believe everything that opening opposition says there about why this is so good, people will just choose it, but you also get an uptick in political discourse and actually acknowledgement and interrogation of people's preference and engagement with voters. Now, I'll talk about democracy, but before I do, I take a POI from closing. Why do you think LDP kept winning in a working democracy? Awesome. Talking about that now, why is the LDP still in power? Firstly, it is, as the opening opposition team said, a part and due the economic development track record of the LDP. Notably though, there are no other alternative options that can point to their economic record of track development because the LDP has been in power for so long. So yes, it is true they're in power for this reason, but it also means they can unfairly weaponize this track record that likely many other countries had post-World War II in Asia because of a particular style of economic development as well. This doesn't necessarily mean they are the best option, but it is the, they are the only option that can weaponize this sort of thing, and that is a democratic harm. But secondly, and very importantly, is the huge amount of funding that this party has in comparison to any other party, which means they can spend a shit ton of it on advertising and making sure the name that everyone remembers when they go into the polling booth is the LDP and that no other party even comes close in sticking in the collective political memory. This also means that for other parties, there is literally no point in contesting, right? Because to the extent that you have to funnel a huge amount of money into a political campaign just to inevitably lose or only gain a few seats so that you can't make a difference is very pointless. So that is another reason why it's entrenched. The third reason is that there's non-compulsory voting. So to the extent people are not hugely mad about issues, maybe they think the economic stuff is good enough and other things are not super important. They just don't show out to vote. There's political inertia and it's worse because of the, again, this is advertising that we talk about. But finally, and as we tell you, parties just stop trying in many different seats, which is particular in seats they don't think are particularly favorable for them, especially if they only have limited funds relative to the LDP, which is particularly important because this means that uniquely some people are locked out of being able to vote for things that represent them. If you sit in an electorate where you don't have full representative democracy, even if there is representative democracy elsewhere in the country, you are not able to access that and we ought to give you the ability to. Next thing I want to hit on is why you don't have a democratic right to exist in a party, because there's actually a very limited explanation, despite them trying to say that they will take down our democratic principle, as to why you do have this democratic right to associate. We tell you that to the extent that it harms competition by consolidating all of money and power in one very powerful group of people, it is probably not true that your ability to group together necessarily impacts that. But also, you can still run, like you can go to the next election as a member of the LDP now in a new party that looks a little bit different, but could potentially have very similar policies, you still have the same name, you still have the capacity to do this. So at worst, the issue of democracy on our side is net neutral. But of course, we proved to you that it gets much better. It is impossible for them to prove a harm when you're still able to run anyway. Finally, on the issue of why it actually promotes democracy, I think this is incredibly important because to the extent that they want to tell you that LDP candidates fight against each other in the status quo to develop the best versions of policies, you probably have to believe that just gets better under our side of the house. To the extent that they are actively different political parties and have to fight to differentiate themselves from each other, if it is true that they still are the best and they still get elected, you just get the best version of the conservative economic policies or conservative social policies that appeals to the most people. So of course, that's definitely preferable in that instance. Secondly, you get a massive uptick in competition from most parties, which I think is very important because now you have competition on ideas beyond just the ideas that are being competitive with the LDP. There's necessarily a limited amount of spectrum that this competition can occur when you have one set ideological position, but that opens up when parties think there's going to be an immediate free-for-all and attempt to gain seats and gain power immediately. But thirdly and very importantly, I think this just forces the electoral system to reset a little bit and for people to reconsider their priorities. So to the extent that you're marginally happy right now in the status quo at the point at which these parties change, 
you have to once again actively engage in politics and reconsider what the most important issues are to you in a, in in the political system. Finally, dealing with that issue about like, oh, this is going to take longer to reach consensus. I think that's an actively good thing. Yes, there are some issues that are critical, but as occurs in those issues and as occurs in other major political party systems, you form consensus on those issues quickly because both parties acknowledge that it's important. That is evident in the US with the debt bill right now. I think what's most important is that Japanese people's views are represented to the maximum possible extent. We have proven why that cannot exist right now in power. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for that fine speech. Maybe have the Deputy Speaker of the Opposition to close off the top half. Hello? Oh? Can I be yeah. seen and heard? Yes, to both. Okay. <sighs> Thank you. All right, I'm gonna hold on. Yeah. I'm gonna start my speech in three, two, one. So I actually don't think the democracy point is that important for three reasons. Firstly, a lot of the reasons they name are like biases that exist in any democratic system, i.e., the incumbent bias, i.e., having some kind of historical like power. But overall, if these are the sources for which the LDP gains its power. When you split this party, it's unclear to me if it's precisely because of these reasons and solely these reasons why they are lost. You have to explain what is the benefit of increasing the amount of political parties in itself. Secondly, they already explained to you that they do change when you had like Kishida's son out partying when he shouldn't be, when you had him out buying groceries and public cars. You had him sacked because approval ratings were going down. You had different people who were part of the parliament sacked because of their ties to the unionist church. Oftentimes, approval ratings, competition within the party is a significant, significant enough incentive to be able to address scandals, to be able to listen to the will of the populace, especially because they know that they don't have this always in the bag. Again, 200, I forget the number, but it's not a significant overwhelming majority such that no party should ever try at any point in the election. Thirdly, what we explain is that there are times where you make uncontroversial issues controversial because you want to use them as bargaining chips, because you want to be able to ensure and undermine the existing incumbent party. When their mandate is not strong, that is when your capacity to undermine these things becomes stronger as well. And what that entails is that things that might have been undebatably good, like funding education, like helping people that are economically disadvantaged, that's when you politicize them because rival parties that are not in power want to make incumbent parties that are in power look bad. But you know what I'm going to do is engage the case where maybe they are not representative of the population in general, or maybe just a significant portion of it. Why is it that having a significant mandate is going to be important for Japan moving into the future? Because Japan is going to have to make some really big and scary decisions. And either Fumio Kishida or either like future like LDP leaders are going to have to oversee them. What are examples of this? The first thing I want to say is engage with CG's POI. The debt to GDP ratio is really, really big. And I think this responds as well to the competition point coming from OG. Competing parties, again, have an incentive to undermine, have an incentive to play up problems like, ah, the debt to GDP ratio is so big and so scary and we have to be able to solve it. And thirdly, to be able to make things controversial and compete upon them, even if they would not have competed otherwise. Why is that important? There are some issues like, like really, really like, inflated currency, like having significant amounts of debt, where you need to be able to commit and keep it on for the long term, because this debt is also good for a couple of reasons. Number one is this debt doesn't just not go anywhere, right? This debt has translated into economic growth, which you need to be able to pay off these debts. But secondly, this is an LDP that has been in power for so long. You don't think that credit markets that can possibly be like lower your credit rating, that could possibly lose confidence, because not only did you have a prime minister, a former prime Prime Minister assassinated in the last year, but now you're going to have a breakup of the largest and most stable political party. The degree of shock that this is going to introduce to this problem is likely to be very big. On our side, it is better, like they're better able to plan out moving into the long-term future and commit the plans that they have already committed to 10, 20 years ago, precisely because they have such a large mandate. Second, to do some of the big and scary changes Japan needs to do right now. For example, they need nuclear energy, which is fusion energy, 
precisely because the population is scared, either because of the atomic bombs, sorry, trigger warning, I should have said that, um, or because of Fukushima. There's large controversy here, but moving into the future, making big and scary changes like investing in this needs a significant mandate because even if your popularity drops, at the very least, you still stay in office and you can continue to do this. Secondly, something like militarization, which Abe was almost able to do, right? Especially with the growing threat of Chinese ICBMs, North Korean ICBMs, and possible Russian support, which is why Japan like met with Ukraine just I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, is precisely what you need because right now, Things like militarization are taboo, are not allowed in the Japanese constitution. And therefore, if you want to make this change, you need a significant mandate in order to do so. Thirdly, you're going to need to tax a lot, to be honest. And that's because Japan's aging population can only be answered by doing things like being able to um, expand childcare policies, incentivize the creation of children, etc. And last year, they already, like, they already met the decline in population that they were supposed to meet like eight years from now, if I'm not mistaken. What that entails is that if any other political party aside from the LDP that would have outcompeted them tries to make these decisions, there is a large anxiety. There is a large fear. But because people know that the LDP has overseen some of the worst crises and gotten through it, and that the LDP has introduced significant changes to the way that we handle our politics and our economy, i.e. abenomics and being able to take on that much debt, but at the same time growing significantly. It is this trust that Japan needs in order to answer for a lot of these problems. Otherwise, not only do you have possibly bad solutions, maybe no solutions at all, because political parties are unable to take such difficult decisions. I think that's the UFO Surely, given the scale of the issues you're talking Hello. about and the potential risk of things like minimization, surely you ought to maximize public discourse and ability to choose. Um, again, they're going to play up these problems. They're going to fear monger people. They're going to compete and make things that would have been good decisions incredibly controversial. Picking and choosing in itself, not a value. Thirdly, relations with other countries. Bay explains that there's a significant amount of confidence already invested in the LDP. And that's important, I would say, for three reasons. And no, this is a more nuanced impact on, oh, no investment, no commitment. Why is this more nuanced? The first thing is that you are going to get only short-term commitments. When you need commitments, even when there are things like nuclear warfare, a threat, and not even nuclear warfare, but increasing Chinese presence in like the South China Sea, for example. All of these things need commitment now because in the instance of crisis, it's very difficult to be able to rely on big powers to come to your aid, especially when it is scary. But... It is the ability to ensure that in the future, you will have the same political party and you can trust them. That you know their politics now will be roughly the same as what their politics may be in the future. That you can trust and invest in these agreements to begin with. And therefore, secondly, when you continuously renew these kinds of agreements, it's always up to who is the more powerful party or country at that time. And therefore, these negotiations are up to the existing and current political context, which if Japan is unable to solve its previous issues, it may be on the back foot at the I think it is best to do them now. But thirdly is you're not going to invest as much money. You're not going to invest as much military resources or trust or political alliances if you fear that in the future you might have a completely different government in power that just fundamentally degrees, disagrees with everything that you had done. What this entails is that the degree for Japan to be able to secure its economic and political future, especially in terms of security, relies heavily on knowing that the LDP will stay and it will stay here for a very long time. For all these reasons, I'm very proud to oppose. I send the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for that fine speech. That closes the top half debate. Now to kick off the back half debate, maybe half a number ago. Hi, am I audible? Yep, you're audible. I think CEO gave a wonderful POI. Why is, the LDP, uh, why is the LDP in power? DPM's response was woefully insufficient. They just restate that they're well-funded and popular already. The first part of our case is to talk about where the centralization comes from and extend on the OG analysis as well as proving why it's bad. First off, voters who aren't educated could just continue to vote for the LDP regardless of their reputation. Voters are also just risk averse, so they avoid other parties because they don't know about them. The LDP has institutional control, which means the party can emphasize itself as a relatively safe vote. 
it's quite strong politically insofar as it already currently captures the majority of the population. But secondly, it's regulatory. There are regulatory strengths. So this means that the judicial system and most of these regulations have been historically set by the LDP. And this means that things are constitutionally binded so that this party has a lot of control over what people do. It's also very strong over different corporations, and it's also able to capture a lot of media attention most of the time because it is the only party that has any particular significance in this place, right? So when people are risk adverse, they are incapable of seeing the opportunity cost of other things. So maybe they'll be able to see that, ah, it's dangerous to vote for this other party because there are all these great things that the LDP is doing, but it's difficult or at least more difficult to understand what, th what happens in the absence of this party being there. So therefore, people are fundamentally skewed from voting for other parties simply due to the existence of such a large party that is in, that is an immovable object. Thirdly, we trade off democracy for other things all the time. So, for example, representatives re representatives instead of like direct democracy and minority rights that are in incredibly unpopular or regional representations that disrupt voter parity or like I think all these things mitigate pure democracy. So lastly, you can probably still vote for like smaller constituent parts of the par party. So we prevent the party from snowballing all of the elections and getting more democratic representation. What I don't think OG sufficiently proves is why the LDP is so powerful. I don't think this sufficiently proves that there's a necessary amount of harm in their existence to warrant even short-term harms of the instability that OO claims to have, right? So at the point which OG just says, ah, well, we support a new repackaged LDP with the same people, they concede that they can't prove anything beyond the worst case. We prove this issue much more extensively, and I'll be addressing power, uh, power centralization. So the first reason for this is it's bad to have one party entrenched in the system because corruption gets significantly worse. There's corrupt relationships as was previously hired with like corporate capture, right? I think that corrupt relationships with like business leaders who feel comfortable paying you off for regulations, at least when you have competition, you call out these things in the media and it's harder for corruption to um, be able to exist in the first place. Secondly, though, all the bureaucrats and judges and everybody is appointed by your party. You can draft whichever things you want. And at that point, it becomes significantly harder to commit to social change. But more crucially, it becomes harder to have like representative things that actually represent different types of ideologies. I think you're just capable of getting whatever you want to have to be passed. Passed, And in a lot of cases, I think there are different political incentives for the people who are in charge as the people in who are democratically supposed to be represented. But I also just want to point at democratic backsliding because your democracy slides closer and closer to autocracy because of the overwhelming and do domineering control of just one party. And this is incredibly important because at the point which democracy matters and it is important for people's votes to be considered, I think that at the point which people are too apathetic to vote for in the, same, in the first place because they feel that their votes won't be able to create any change, I think it's incredibly important to be able to break up these parties and allow people to be more engaged in voting. So when the parties are very big and it seems like there's nothing which is be able to be changed, as I said, people will become apathetic. So I, I, I want to point at something here then. First off, you, I think this actually looks like some referendums on some of the key issues facing the country. Don't let OO get away of writing this off as, oh, the parties are playing theatrics or they're fear mongering the people. I think there are some key issues facing the country. You get more like voter engagement and you also get the willingness of parties to become bolder because the mood is that they're changing. And also they probably need to differentiate from other parties to be able to be voted for in the first place, right? So in the long term, the new political alignment becomes significantly more accurate to what people actually want. And yeah, I think that's also, the Japan just has a lot of important things that need to be changed in the status quo. So, for example, in the section 8 of the Constitution, they talk about not being able to militarize. I think this is incredibly important today, but there are also other things that might be important, like gay marriage and legalizing these types of things that are probably d discussions that Japan wants to have. So... The next thing I want to talk about is advancing social progress. Social progress is quite important. The case here is that social progress is barred from happening in the status quo, and social progress is at least able to happen on Gov. And Op doesn't get to make an argument about this being undemocratic, because we already prove why we engage more people into the democratic system and thus serving more people on our side. But also, if it's true that these social changes which are proposed are not desirable, then presumably the Japanese population just will not vote in these parties that want to represent this type of change. But insofar as we acknowledge certain things as being good, the ability for the Japanese population to ad advocate for less conservative ideas is probably quite important. And I think the impacts of this are going to be fucking humongous, right? Where the most marginalized people in Japan are able to, I don't know, get some policies that are beneficial to them to be, be voted in. And the breakdown of Japanese like oppressive structures like the Japanese patriarchy are probably going to positively impact a lot of people. I'll take a POI before I move on from CO. Uh oh So there's no real delta. If this is 
opposition to LDP competition, uh, breaking up would have no change because they would do it already. If this is LDP to LDP competition, this has already happened as proven by Miko and I in our speeches, wherein they fire people even if they're like Nepo babies. Yeah, I don't think this is true because it's important for us to get voters to decide what happens. It's not for these parties to have interior changes on what they decide this type of competition looks like, right? I, I don't think that it's true that these these parties are just going to fundamentally change over time just because the people in these parties want to promote some degree of change. I think it's important for us to have some degree of social progress because of the ways that Japan has Japan has already been become entangled in the global system or become entangled within its own constitu uh, constituents, right? So, uh, yeah, OO's first claim is that political parties, when they are competing, are likely to play the size of the issue and try to compete for different voter bases. I'm really unclear why political discourse is a bad thing. If the argument here is just that politics are theatrical, I'd argue that some discourse that clues people into the degree of reflection and also engaging more people into the election far outweighs some instability and people being worried. I think they may make a better claim when they talk about for, uh, like foreign investments, but when Japan isn't Im immediately willing to cooperate with the US, note this happens only when you have multiple parties and the US is uncertain if Japan is going to cooperate. The, the relationship between Japan and US, I can't stress how important this is to the US, like American military bases being dotted around Japan like Yokoda and Misawa. But Japan is also just an incredibly big trade partner. I think that these things are important because the US views the things done in Japan as progress. They probably do not want to backtrack on this progress. And since Japan and the status quo is quite pro-US, it's unclear why this would change. But I think that in this case, on foreign investments, if we just weigh foreign relationships against foreign investments, US takes Japan for granted in the status quo in a lot of ways. I think this is likely to change. So we, take, we win on the point of foreign investments as well. Proud to propose. As I'm the speaker for that fine speech, maybe now I have a member of opposition make a case for closing off. Um, audible. Yep. Great. Um, QI to unmute. Um, I'll take one from opening if, yeah, for cross bands engagement. All right. I'll start when I start. Man, how of this team that brought cool name, big words, and big things in this debate? What CUS is going to do is that CUS is going to humanize this debate. Talk about why this split what leads to a deeper dive and leaning towards conservatism inside the Japanese political spectrum, inside Japanese society. And this is not just about polarization, but a higher leaning towards a specific belief that would A, be extremely undemocratic, but B, are extremely problematic for a lot of individuals with different protected identity. Three pieces of framing. The first is that I'm quite confused on what Uji and CG Delta is. If it is true that LDP is conservative and are unwilling to change, then why would breaking them up would change anything? Breaking up conservative party would lead to more conservatism sprouting and increasing. We're going to mechanize this on site closing opposition. And the second step this motion presumes and says that LDP is more conservative than the reflected society. This is important because this shows that currently there are progress with the society that choose regression social realizations and left-leaning belief. The fact that gay marriage is a discussion to begin with means that there are progress and all of those progress would die on site of government. And a lot of CGs and like, opening government response is going to be integrated in regards to conservatism and also splitting up. So let's talk about the spawns of political party and variants. The thesis here is that I'm going to prove why is it unlikely that variety and the illusion of option is unlikely to occur on site government during the breaking up. Because note that a lot of CG's argument is still very reliant on the spawns of political party that would come from this particular breakup would be somewhat would be something that is entirely different. We would argue this is, would be very much the same due to three structural reasons. The first is that they're the same individual within the party and conservatism is what they know. Politician that came from the same lineage, alliance, coalition and such, right? Especially knowing that coalition is a thing. So even if they're quite different, most likely they will still do coalition anyway. So why is it unlikely to occur that they would like coalize again? 
And most likely this is something that they personally believe, right? So just because my party is broken up, doesn't mean that suddenly I can switch my political leaning as an individual and my whole structural belief and who I believe in, uh, what specific concept that I believe in society, like suddenly change. Like if we agree that politics should be about representing what the people want, it should be inherent that politicians also believe in what they are saying and in what their belief is conservatism when you break them up, Oh, conservatism. The second is that they know what society wants and what works, and it's been shown to be some level of extreme conservatism on the majority scale. So what most likely to happen is that they would want to win, and they will still work within the same particular framework for campaign. The third is that the funding remains from the same corporation and some levels of connection. Look, most political people inside political party comes from individuals who have some levels of connection to a corporation who wants to lobby and have specific belief in specific things, specific political leaning. This means most likely they would still have the same level of connection towards the, those corporations. They would be likely to push the same agenda. The conclusion here is that this reduced the delta of impact from government bench. But moreover, this increases those harm because now people have varying options, not of different political belief, but very varying option of conservatism that focus on things such as great religion. the impact of this. The impact of having spawns of conservative small political party are three. The first is inflammation. They have to outcompete each other and polarize each other in funding supports and etc. with increased level of populism and demonization against one party and another. The second is societal reaction. Most likely won't be great. The common supporter of LDPD who have far so long united are now divided and forced to make a decision and are now forced to go against each other. The third is the variance of demonization in conservatism. Them. This means a deeper dive into the evils of the particular concept and the belief that I should demonize individuals from specific, uh, you know, protected identity, such as women, for example, such as, for example, an individual from LGBTQ community and etc. Right. The conclusion here is that I disagree with OO who says that this is going to be U.S., where there are going to be two very different parties attacking against each other. Rather, two parties are essentially believing the same thing, but fighting against each other to win a pragmatic political debate, a political race like in Indonesia. And the cost of this is extremely huge. We have seen a large amount of demonization in my countries where they heavily focus on varying different degrees of conservatism towards religion, race, and etc. This is not just polarization like what OO says. It's an increase leaning to specific political belief that flips a lot of government side harm on democracy. But also, this is the most charitable response compared to OO, because even if polarization does not happen, they will still coalesce against each other anyway. And CEO is the only thing that mechanizes what types of party that would sprung up and how it has very little amount of variance. Let's talk about LDP and progress. The thesis here is that OO might do a good job in explaining what LDP can do now, but it is true for any strong party anywhere, right? But not in the future. So what LDP can do in the future and why is it a much more preferable standard? I just think that a deeper variance into conservatism is something that's already bad. So I think we should already win the debate by that particular analysis. But to add, A, optic and reputation. A huge nebulous controlling party cares about buy-in and potential street grads, reputation and people not attacking you. A good parallel to this is the leaders of China who cares about optics so much to the extent that he implement a ban on Thing we need to prove, meaning on our side there are capacities for society to criticize progress and it is within the interest of LDT to maintain power and optics when they will listen. Um, before that, I'll make opening. Militarization is politically uncontested right now, but it's likely incredibly unpopular with the US, wrote the no war clause, and China, who will see militarization as an extension of US threat, surely voters ought to have agency over a policy that could undermine national security and their safety. Yeah, you have to prove why is it that the party that would sprung up from this breaking up would oppose militarization. We have told you that it will be literally be the same thing. It's not enough for you to say that it will be different. You have to mechanize it, opening government. Moreover, it's easier to mobilize all of our criticism and belief to one party rather than it being split. Like right? You don't know which party you want to criticize the most. You have to divide your political capital to criticize a specific party. And that's very tiring for a lot of women. It's better in our alternative where it's just one party. The second is the difference in opinion. OG can see to this. Why not let this happen inside the party? Meaning current roots are happening anyway within the current status quo. If their mechanization in saying that this party would have variance is that, ah, they have different beliefs. Why don't you let it happen naturally within this political party? Meaning the system has worked. 
The third is natural shift, the inclusion of youth within the party to be consistently relevant. LDP to begin with has a soft stance to get engaged marriage and it can potentially change. Like the very fact that immigration is a uh, population is reclining in age there, meaning that naturally immigration is something they will be open up to because they need fucking human resources. So naturally this will progress would still happen anyway. The wing is A, progress are beyond to what OO brings. We agree in OG in saying that there are a level of conservatism and option to expand, but the manifestation of that option can wholly happen in CO. Economy from OO may be true, but they are very poor to a lot of government response. And we flip a lot of government harm since they cannot prove right. variance. We think that proof variance is unlikely. Proud to a books. I thank the speaker for that fine speech. Also, as you know, we will not be taking notes after 7.15. Having said that, may we have the gov whip to post the case for CG. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Great. Um, I'll take verbal POIs starting in three, two, one. CO badly misunderstands our case at the point in which they think we care if successor parties are conservative or not. Our main thrust was on institutional capture. And the logic behind this argument is that any party, no matter if it's communist or conservative, controlling for government for a long period of time, inherently entrenches itself within the system. The idea here is as you accumulate appointed positions. So when all of the judges and all of the bureaucrats in Japan have been appointed by your party and owe their loyalty to your government. At the point at which you form ties to big business, because you're the only one worth lobbying at the point at which no other party is threatening you, at the point at which no other party has control over regulators to reveal your corruption, at the point at which there is no party punish the companies themselves for supporting their opponents upon an opposition victory in an election, you get much more corruption and much more regulation shaped towards the interest of the largest corporations. We say you have ties to media at the point at which the government controls all of the interviews for important political campaigns, at the point at which it controls all of the leaks that are made to the press, at the point at which it controls tax breaks for different types of media organization. You can ensure that the only media that survives and can do political coverage effectively is media that covers you well. We don't think this point has anything to do with a conservative or progressive political ideology. And we think we present you four impacts. The first one is you get large and widespread apathy in Japanese political society at the point at which it seems like one party controls every institution and there's not even a point in contesting elections because they are so dominant. The second thing we say is you get a lot more corruption at the point at which the institutions and watchdogs and competition and elections that are supposed to hold, hold politicians accountable, as well as the uncertainty held by lobbyists and people like looking to do bribes uh, about which party will win the election does not exist. The third thing we say is you get backsliding. And look, maybe Japan doesn't become a full autocracy. It's been a long time. It might have happened by now. But we think we can get backsliding in other meaningful areas. So, for example, reform of election commissions, uh, gerrymandering, things that just make it harder to contest LDP dominance. And the fourth and final thing that we say is at the point at which you control the judiciary and the regulators, the basic rights extended to Japanese citizens no longer mean anything because they're entirely captured by one political party and there is nobody protect them from the whims of the majority. So I think with this extension said, I want to refute CO very briefly. I think the first thing that I want to say is that their point is contradicted by stuff we say in our speech, and they don't really explain why their counter characterization is very likely. What we say is this new election that occurs after breaking up these parties is purely issues focused at the point at which you get all existing politicians and all existing records out of the election. And therefore, what you're likely to see is a realignment of Japanese politics around generally held ideological beliefs. The info slide says that the LDP is to the right of the average Japanese person, or at least to the right of Japan. So it you seems like if they lose their structural advantages, like institutional capture, like funding, like incumbency bias, then probably the parties that emerge become more left wing, not more right wing. Now that they can say that the right wing parties like compete with each other to become more right wing, and maybe there's more of a fringe right, but we don't see this as a significant factor. The other thing they say is like the right wing LDP parties will just form a collection again, like look at the model, they're not allowed to do that. I'll take a POI from OO before I move on. So this ignores all the internal party accountability mechanisms. But even then, MG says we trade democracy and preference off all the time. You need a big mandate to solve a lot of the problems we discuss at OO. Yeah, I'll engage with you shortly. Don't worry. So I think MO is probably out of this debate at the point in which they give an implausible extension. But I also think the scale of our impacts are much more important than theirs for reasons I'm going to get into in OO. So let's move on to OO. I think the problem with the OO case is they are 
literally just defending a one party state for both of their speeches and pretty everything they say could cross apply to any other country that is not doing so well, like Turkey. And I think the reason this is an actual analytical problem and not a rhetorical dunk is their speech just reads like a list of different empirical examples of things that you're supposed to believe the LDP can do well in the status quo. But the problem is that the ability to produce solutions, both incentivize and capacity lies, flows from political structure. So I don't understand why, even if by happenstance, the LGB can be somewhat competent in the status quo, why they're likely to be more competent than comparative political parties that don't have these sorts of institutional advantages that reinforce power and mitigate accountability. Why don't their alternative accountability metrics actually work? I think the problem here is that firstly, you just get less accountability at the point at which the party is able to control regulators and the government and the media and mislead voters about what's really going on. I think the second thing to note here is interior party accountability is worse at the part at which the only voice, votes that count in a primary are people who are part of your party. So maybe there is accountability to the most conservative or religious or traditional sections of Japan, but for the people who don't adhere to this, and by the info slide, they're a majority, they don't really have any say over the leadership of Japan unless they join a party they fundamentally disagree with. I think the last thing I want to note here is just on their idea that you need like a big mandate to solve problems Japan has. I think we proved to you in Raymond's speech this election acts like a referendum on key issues. And we think it's likely that if these issues are as important to Japan as they say, parties will run on those in the campaign, propose solutions. And if their solutions are good, they'll receive a democratic mandate to enact them. If they're not good, that probably signals that more debate and discussion is necessary to decide the right approach. But even if you believe that in the short term, there are benefits to leaving the LDP in power, or maybe believe that they're like uniquely competent for some magical reason, I think there are reasons you should still prefer our side. The first thing is in the long term, it's definitely worse to have a party that has institu institutional capture of government because accountability will always slide downwards and power will always tend to centralize. And that means incentives to do things well get worse. We also think we give you a host of side benefits. So corruption that destroys the ability of consumers to be protected, the destruction of minority rights, like the erosion of Ainu minority rights in Japanese courts when all judges are appointed by this conservative ethnic nationalist party. We think also on a values question, so like more immigration or gay marriage, you don't necessarily have a pragmatic resolution the LDP can only make, and you don't forward this in a referendum in a democratic election, so you get worse outcomes there. So I think on the long term, in terms of the quality of policy you get, we do improve over them. And we also have a host of other benefits that seem pretty significant as well. That's why we beat out OO. Moving on then briefly to opening government. Why do we beat them? I think opening government tries to attack in similar ways we do by providing a point about accountability and competition. But I think it was what astutely is pointed out by opening opposition is that most democracies in the world have funding disparities between different parties, have incumbency advantages, and have parties that can be in power for a long time. As long as there is still electoral competition, it seems like the LDP can just keep winning and winning and winning. And it doesn't seem like the threshold to intervene in such a significant way and actually break up a party as the government is met. We tell you at the point in which a party has captured institutions in a country for 70 years that barriers met. That's not something you see elsewhere in the world. I think the other thing that we say is we provide unique benefits that escape the sort of deadlock in internal and external party accountability at the point at which we tell you that a party of any ideology holding power for this long is just really destructive to quality of life. For those reasons, proud to propose. Thank the speaker for that fine speech. And now to end this debate, maybe have the opposite. All right, am I audible? Yeah. Um, okay, cool, sorry. Couldn't hear you for a second. Um, before that, bef I mean, before my speech, disclaimer, the extent to which I'm familiar with Japanese politics is limited to things I read online and the tweets I saw. I hope I do not do the Japanese population disservice. So for your understanding, I say in advance both gomenasai and arigato gozaimasu. So I will start my speech in three, two, one. I think we need to break down a lot of things here to fully understand the metrics that we should use in the debate. The info slide says that they have been around since 1955, yet they're still in power, which means that even if there's some degree of discrepancy in ideology, the people trust the general stability of the party because having, let's say, more parties is potentially scary in the idea of Japanese people. The info slide also says that they are seen as more conservative despite being voted in by the people, which means that when people voted for these members of the parliaments and the views of the majority, majority today are different. What these things tell you are two things. Number one, 
ideology of the people can change. This framing alone takes CG out because their argument is contingent upon people not realizing they can expand their horizons. But by virtue of the motion and info slide, people have a shift in their perception already. But even if it's not written in the info slide, honestly, saying that people not being able to think on their own is a bit dehumanizing, no? Um, B, Japan is not a country that isolates globalization, so they have been exposed to things that are going around the world. So choices in OG and the helping people to realize points in CG do not hold any grounds in this debate. CG is also out because corruption is against the blood and vein of Japanese people. I think O already addressed this, that politicians, when pushed to resign and identify in a scandal, can easily be put aside. C, Jap Japan has no significant issue in political apathy. This is not the US um, that we are talking about. The most likely reason why people are still voting for the LDP is the second point that I wanted to talk about, stability. It is what the people prioritize. Polarization that my member talked about is how stability will be burnt down in shambles. So what are we defending by saying that they should not be broken up? It would be easier for the people to help push for change if it is indeed true that majority of the people have a shift in their overtone window. Then it's easier to have a more amicable citizen to government relationship. The people have some degree of trust to the government and the LDP does owe to the people for their power. So we say it's likely for organic change to happen. Let's break down these differences in terms of the political um, let's say actions of LDP. Gay marriage. The way LDP opposes this is very soft. They said, um, they said, if there is a definite proof, the, the LDP said, if there is a definite proof that the people want change, then they can legalize it in the future. Which means that if it's true what OO said, that ratings and polls matter, then it's easier to convince the government that people actually want this. Immigration. Japan only has a couple of years to weaponize anti-immigration rhetoric because they have a declining population rate. The more they push for anti-immigration laws, it's just a matter of time that the young population are banding together to demonstrate peacefully, perhaps, because the cost for geriatric care is burdening the state. What O did not do with those examples they talk about is to explain there is a reasonable degree for change to happen should the people demand for it. This is an important mechanization because it disproves every urgency brought by both government teams because then there's no need to, for us to break them up. So when things are stable and amicable, it would be easier to push for change to fly in this context. Why then breaking them up is necessarily worse for the Japanese population? OG talk about political competition that will bring, uh, that will bring about choice. Having more choices is not an inherent benefit. Having politicians trying to differentiate themselves is not an inherent benefit either. We say it's unlikely for them to differentiate. They can just coalesce with one another again if it gets their coalition to win the election again. The info slide says that they have a coalition with a 29-seat party. Given the LDP already controls more than 50%, so probably this coalition is because of the adjacency of their ideology. So this proves that the likelihood of them just coalescing again after being broken up, just different names, but they still can coalesce. They are allowed to build coalition. I guess this concept is alien to both OG and CG, and therefore there's no delta on their side. But even if they do differentiate, that's where polarization ma manifests. That's where they try to fuel differences even further that we have seen are not going to look good. Politicians catering to the young will fight with the politicians catering to the old because they need to differentiate themselves. They will try to pit the people against one another. And that's how exactly stability is going to be ruined on their side. Stability is an important metric because that's probably the only reason that why Japanese people still vote for LDP despite the differences, despite the changes because they trust how the system will work on their behalf. And exactly because the majority of the population is no longer majority, I already said majority, no longer young, that's why stability is the most important metric. This means that if it's true, competition is an inherent benefit, then it would increase the, generation, the generational gap. The welfare policies that all talk about will be highly politicized so, so that the young and the old probably will not agree, which makes our point more mechanistically important as well. You're pitting the Japanese population across the spectrum against each other. This is why neither the choice point from OG nor the realization point from CG will manifest in a favorable way. Choice tips the scale to political polarization. Realization manifests in the form of people realizing what they need to preserve and therefore only accentuates political differences differences and political priorities. This course on issues that CG talk about is not an inherent benefit if it puts the Japanese population in shambles, as I've explained about, because you're putting these differences in the uh, community even further, which in the end is the reason that why we should not break them up. I will, uh, I will take OG. It's obviously not in the interest of LDP MDs to become increasingly polarized because they know they're more conservative than the rest of the population. What we actually get is crucial public discussion that doesn't happen because of funding differences Wait. to respond to the ideas that... 
But that's what you said. They will have to differentiate in order to win in power, which means that they need to cater to different groups of people, accentuating these differences. That's literally your mech. But sure, even if things suddenly work in favor of golf teams, it's not going to be it's not going to be long lasting. It's just a matter of time before these politicians pit people against each other to benefit their positioning in the coming election. It's just a matter of time before these choices turn into polarization that will only hurt the people on the ground. Political subtlety is the most important metric in this debate because the order within the Japanese population is ingrained in the idea of avoiding chaos and, res and to respect each other. We do not need to make unnecessary fuel to make this principle win out in a society. That's exactly what golf teams are doing. Under the same content, we also win against OO because OO was not able to identify a single metric to determine their path to victory. They have a lot of case studies while LDP is good without explaining just because they could. It does not mean that they should, exactly because they've been in power for so long. CO is the one who explained why they have the interest to be good and to cater to the people as much as possible. CO is the one who explained why we protect Japanese population in a more impactful manner because all stopped when we needed to care for the aging population or other policies that made me realize I need to re read more probably. However, we told you specifically how breaking up works against that intention and how by not breaking LDP is the way to protect these people. CO was also the one who took LDP at their worst. We understand that they are conservative and nebulous and probably not perfect, but these changes can happen in the future exactly because of the dynamics with the people and LDP at this point. All the above reasons tell you that breaking the LDP is not with in the interest of the government, the population across the spectrum, younger or older, liberal or conservative, they will be hurt. This is an analysis debate. The burden of each team is to analyze the extent to which the statement should be true or not. See your proof that breaking them up is against the interest of the actor stipulated, which means the statement is false. See did that. See you one. Thank you. Thank the speaker for a very fine speech. And that also ends this wonderful final. Thank you to all of the teams. Um, could we perhaps have a room for the judges.